Oh yeah, it's me. I'm back with another video. Okay, so, um, all right. So today I wanted to talk about like why don't I have a bunch of gear behind me, or why don't or in front of me, or why don't I have a bunch of MIDI controllers, or why don't I do videos like reviewing plugins or synths or drum machines or whatever. Um, and for me, the answer to this kind of comes back to what I find interesting about electronic music and a couple other things that we'll sort of touch on. Um, so, for example, when you think about the kind of, or when I think about the history of electronic music, I think about stuff like, you know, those first kind of drum machines and synths and stuff. So a, a good example for this is like the 303, right? When it came out, it was supposed to be like a bass it was supposed to sound like a bass, and it kind of didn't really, and um, and so it became unpopular and cheap. And then uh, people who couldn't afford it before got their hands on it, and they started to screw around with it, and it wasn't like they were going to just buy a better one or whatever. It was like what they had, right? So what, and then they decided to kind of do what they could with what they had. Right? This is going to be kind of the reoccurring theme of this video. Um, and uh, and that's where all of this really cool shit came from, is them just trying to figure out a cool way to use it. And it was like, well, we've got this sound. Let's see, like, m maybe we can make it work or maybe we can make it interesting. And from that was born a ton of different genres like anything with acid in the name of it is named after that synth now right so uh, the 303 so um yeah i think for me there's like this th there's two things that are cool about that story one is that there's, there's no like financial barrier to entry really for getting into music it was sort of like okay we found this thing in the dumpster <laughs> or whatever and we're going to we're going to figure out what we can make with it and for sure like if you have something that can't you know say there's like the cool style of music or whatever and the tool that you have can't make that then there's this sort of feeling of like okay so what can we make with this and these whole different styles of music blossomed out of that, of like, this is what we can do with, with what we have. And if we work on it and refine it, we can make it cool, right? That's one thing. And then the other thing is sort of like, just getting to really know your, the stuff that you have and seeing how you can sort of exploit it, right? The history of the 303 is really about like, exploiting the, the undesirable parts of the 303. Right? That acid, that classic acid sound is, it was not something that anybody desired before it's, people started messing around with it and being like, actually, this sounds kind of cool. Let's like kind of, let's make tracks with this, this weird sound. Um, and that to me is, is super inspiring, right? Um, I also think that that, that kind of, uh, like, there is sort of a lot of snobbiness about about like hardware and gear and stuff and or for example like you go to play a show and somebody's like oh what are you just using that like you're just oh you don't have any synths like oh it's probably not going to be that good then <laughs> you know or that, like there's this like oh he's using a or she's using a blah 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 and, and you know, for example, I've had some students, uh, like, they're like, they come to me and they're like, you know, I played a couple shows and, and people came up to me and were like, were like, oh, you're using that? Like, what, what do I get so that they don't say that or whatever, right? Which is sad. Like, th it's not your audio interface that's going to decide whether the show is good or not. It's not your MIDI controller that's going to decide whether the show is good or not. It's the it's the music, right? Um, and also, I think it sort of makes it this kind of like rich kid club, right? Like modular stuff, for example, is super expensive. And 
it's like not everybody can afford a huge modular rack and I don't think you need a huge modular rack to make really crazy sounds. In fact, I've had a lot of people say that they think that my stuff sounds really analog, which is hilarious to me because I don't have any analog gear. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I think that's there, there's some kind of you know, and we also get this 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 thing of like. Um, you know, people who don't really understand how to make music because they're not musicians or because they're not electronic musicians or they're just getting into it or whatever. You know, for example, they place like a lot of importance on like, oh, is it live or something, which is like, that's a whole other conversation. Or like, oh, but, you know, they're only doing X, Y, Z or whatever. And they kind of understand, it's like their understanding of music comes from like how much work is put in it's like a sort of a sports way of evaluating the the value of something right it's like well this person worked really hard and and therefore the thing is good and that's not really applicable to the arts i don't think like it's can be an interesting part of how something is made but in the end it's not it's inconsequential to whether the piece of art or piece of music or whatever is good, right? Um, <clears throat> um, I kind of think of, actually, I, th I kind of think of Daft Punk in this this situation. Like, <laughs> they're very, very famous. And, uh, you know, for example, Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger is is just a different song that they put a robot voice over <laughs> and sped up a little bit like that's that wasn't a huge work day i don't think <laughs> um okay so anyway so <clears throat> also i think there's this sort of like mysticism kind of attached to to analog stuff that it's like oh it's the magic of the transistors or whatever or like with modular stuff it's like oh it's so complicated which I also kind of don't, I like I kind of don't buy it. Like, um, you know, it may be confusing if you don't, if you haven't played with it before or that if you don't understand how a bunch of stuff works, like how envelopes work or LFOs or whatever, or like how different types of synthesis work, then yeah, I can imagine it can be kind of confusing. I mean, to add to that, like, a lot of, like, modular synth manufacturers, like, they go hard on that, on that juju, you know? Like, they're sort of like, uh, like, ooh, it's the X, X-morph knob that does. We don't even, we're not even going to tell you what it does, you know? <laughs> Which is kind of funny to me. Um, anyway, so... <clears throat> And, you know, not to shit on anybody who has modular. Like, I, I think it's cool. Like, if you, and especially if you can afford it. Like, if, if I could afford it, I would love to have some modular gear. I don't think I would make videos about it or make the music that I release with it. And part of that is, like, an ideological thing, I think. Because... I want people to be able to, to like to, to think that they could do what I do. I want people to believe that. I want them to feel like I'm not, it's not like, there's no gatekeeping here. I'm not like, I want them to feel like, oh, I could, I could do that. Oh, I should try that. I should try that. I want to get into it, you know? I want more people to come in to making music because it's really, you know, the more people that make cool music, the more cool music I get to listen to, which I think is great. It's part of why I teach. That's part of why I make these videos and stuff because I want more people to get into this stuff, especially the weird niche that I inhabit. <laughs> um, and I guess that you inhabit too if you're watching this. Um, 
Okay, so that's kind of that, like the gatekeeping, the snobbiness, I kind of don't get down with with that, which isn't like an inherent part of the the having the gear, but I think it's something that's kind of hard to escape, I guess. Um, and, you know, even when I see a, a video with somebody who has like a, and they're like showing off how to it's like, well, I don't have that, so I can't, <laughs> there's not much I can do. I can try to make it myself or whatever, which we'll get to a little bit later. So this, the, the second thing for me is like um, this idea of commodified cultural capital. So cultural capital is this, this sort of idea that like y you, you have like the, the faith of of other pe people take it like you're sort of important like that you have the trust of of people right and a lot of the time you can sort of do the reason it's called capital is that you can kind of take that trust to the bank right people will trust that you're going to do a good job so they're they're going to pay you more they're going to trust you so they're not going to like kind of question you as much and and for example, in a con in a contract type situation, um, having that like sort of trust of the people, of people, quote unquote, um, can kind of help you generate money. And commodified cultural capital is this sort of idea that, like, stuff that you buy that makes it seem like you have the cultural capital, right? So if if you see a video of, you know, Dead Mouse or, or we, you know, actually this a bit maybe a better example is like someone that you've never heard of, but you click on their video and they've got a bunch of fucking crazy rack gear behind them and, and, you know, they've got all the stuff, right? The video sounds really crisp and clean. The, the thing it's like in your head you're sort of like, oh, this person must know what they're doing. Right? There's this sort of assumption, and I think like if we question it, it doesn't, it's not always that we really think that consciously, but it's like a, this kind of subconscious clue like, oh, this person must really know what they're doing. It's kind of like that idea of like if you're going to try to sa sound smart, then you stand in front of a bookcase, which is a really funny thing to think about if you like look at videos on YouTube of all the people who are like talking about philosophy and stuff, like <laughs> just look out for that. It's a really funny, like when you start noticing the amount of people like standing in front of bookcases. Um, so, right. So this is this sort of like commodified cultural capital. And it, to me, I feel like, I think it would do me a lot of good to just embrace that, just buy some stuff that I could set up behind me to make it look like I, you know, or, or, or whatever, buy a better camera or something so I can do these videos a little bit more fancy. <laughs> For other reasons other than the commodified cultural capital thing, but but for that as well, right? Like it's like you're sort of building trust with your audience. Um, but I also there's a part of me that also fucking hates that. Like, it's like why, why why is it like that? That like that kind of, I don't know. That it kind of, which is like I think it's a kind of a bad, it's a bad habit I have of like fighting. Fighting, fighting the system, man. <laughs> but like, in places where it's inconsequential and stupid. <laughs> Anyways, but there's there's kind of something about that 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 bothers me a little bit. Like I kind of, so I sort of wish that the the work would speak for itself enough that I don't know. I remember I watched this like this interview with James Holden, and they take a little studio tour, and his studio at the time was like this really tiny crappy little room with like a bunch of like weird like toys everywhere and and these little figurines that he really liked and and he's got this like broken drum machine thing from a garage sale or something and this crappy mic that he had pointed at an amp or something and I, I found that so inspiring to see that when I was younger, just like, just like, oh, you don't need to buy all this stuff. 
I guess this is the thing that I'm circling around to, right? Like I want when people see my studio, I don't want them to think like, oh, I need to buy this, that, that, and the other thing before I can do this. I want them to feel like they can, they can just jump in, right? It's like you don't need all that stuff to make cool, cool music. You, you, you can just, you can just make cool music. Um, and you know, the, in the background of all this, probably in your head, you're thinking, well, you have a computer, and computers are not cheap or free or whatever. And I agree, I agree with you there. And I think like, you know, in, in, in and this is totally like a sort of privileged perspective, but I think like, you know, for me, when I was growing up, there was like a family computer. And then, and when I started making music, it was sort of like on the family computer that would kind of putz around on there and, and try to make stuff that I thought sounded good. And that was sort of what really got me into making music on the computer was like, I had this guitar pro program where you could write in sheet music or tab or something, whatever. And, and then you could get it to play back with like any MIDI instrument. And I remember writing like so much marimba music at the time because the marimba stuff sounded awesome. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, so I think that's true to a certain extent. I've also, um, I also like, uh, you know, th- I think there's also like cool apps that you can get on your phone if you're trying to like get into music. And now we're kind of getting to the place where almost everybody kind of has a phone or a computer. And, and I guess like also if you're in the position where you're, not able to afford a computer, then nah, maybe you st- well, whatever, you can make other kinds of music. Anyway, so that's a question for another time. I think that that really is a, is a much bigger question that could be kind of expanded on a lot. Um, so I'm, I admit, I'm sort of taking it for granted of like having a computer. I don't think you need an amazing computer to make music. I will say that. And I, for a long time, did not have an amazing computer. Uh, I had a crap, kind of a crappy computer. (laughs) Um, And CPU was a big limitation. And I think there's something really, that really got out of that. It used to drive me crazy, actually, when when I heard people say, like, oh, the possibilities of making music on a computer are so endless that I don't, that I, I, I don't like it. And that's why I get hardware stuff. It doesn't drive me crazy anymore. I, I get it. Like, I understand why people say that. But I remember for so long, it would drive me crazy because in my head, I was like, what are you talking about? They're not endless. It's like, so I run into the limits, like all the time, <laughs> you know, like it's a CPU cap, for example. It's like, it's easy to run into your max CPU usage and learning to be efficient with your CPU usage, learning what things you can, you can freeze and flatten or, or render out or whatever, what processes that you can do that are more efficient and sound just as good is a really interesting and important part, I think, of making music on the computer. Um, there's also things that, you know, the, the current, the software that you have isn't able to do right there's you might want to you know it's it's become a little less relevant with max for live now because you can do quite a lot but there's always stuff that you kind of that you can't do um and it's i think it's super interesting to kind of run into those boundaries and think about okay well how am i going to get around this how am i going to figure out either a workaround so that I still can do the thing that I want to do or, uh, or how am I going to live without, right? Uh, one example that kind of comes to mind is like the Ableton reverb, right? We often kind of talk about how the Ableton reverb, or no, I mean, not you and I, but, (laughs) but people often talk about how the Ableton reverb is like not the greatest reverb. And, uh, like it, if you want a nice sounding reverb, you generally will will get a different one. 
But I think that opens up this interesting opportunity of like, okay, so what can we use the Ableton reverb for? What, what cool sounds can we make with it? If like a normal reverb sound is not the thing that we use it for, then surely we can use it for something else, right? Instead of just throwing it away and, and getting something else and, and moving on with it. Um, yeah, so that's the next thing. And then, you know, to a certain extent, I also think like, you know, when I was younger, there was this whole kind of like promise of the internet age that you could kind of like be anybody online. And I think that's like sort of less true now. <laughs> to a certain extent, we kind of conceptualize the internet in a different way now. I think I still sort of like hold a little bit of that hype within me of like, of being like, ah, oh, well, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, like if I'm, if I make cool music, then people will sort of trust that I know what I'm doing um, without me having to show up in front of like a wall of cool gear. I mean, yeah, things are a bit different now. Like you gotta have a presence and you gotta make those parasocial relationships, <laughs> whatever. I don't know, there's still a part of that I think that that's that's sticks with me. It's part of why I like being online. Um, yeah. Um, and then I guess the last thing is um, if you limit yourself of like, okay, I can't, I'm not going to buy that or I'm not going to whatever, right? Plugins or hardware, whatever, MIDI controllers. Um, you have this other interesting avenue that opens up, which is sort of the DIY route. It's one of my favorite things, actually, when I see a plugin that I want, but I can't afford it. I'll try and make the part that I'm excited about of the plugin in, in Max. And it's a really good learning experience. You know, you because first you have to try to figure out how is the thing doing the thing that I want to do? How does it work? And then you have to try to figure out how to make that. And while you're making it, you can add whatever little bits and bobs that you want to along the way. You know, there is no restriction of like, oh, the knob only goes to 70. And so it is what it is. It's like, no, the knob goes as far as I want it to go, you know? I set the range. I set what it does. Maybe it's attached to another thing at the same time. I think there's a lot of really cool kind of stuff with that. There's also, for example, with hardware, you can kind of like make your own hardware, which is not free by at all. Um, but it's also not as expensive, and it's really interesting. Um, I think you could make... For example, with MIDI controllers, that's one of the ones that's always kind of dro driven me crazy. Like, I think you could make a pretty decent MIDI controller for, like, 20 bucks, probably. Maybe. Eh, I mean, that's maybe a little bit small. Low. 40. 40 for sure, you could make a banging MIDI controller. Um, for sure, you could make one as good as, like, the $100 ones. Um... And you could make it exactly the way that you want. Well, not exactly. I mean, come on, it's only $40. <laughs> but, you know, you could make it your own way. You could make it the way that you could make it be like you wanted it to be, right? And I think there's something really interesting about that as well. I, I really feel like, you know, as musicians making electronic music, like we should learn a little bit of like programming. Like how does this stuff work? How is it doing all this stuff? stuff that we want to do and I understand that like audio programming is super hard and just like kind of getting your head around how signal processing works is not it's not an easy subject but it's super interesting and and yeah anyways so that was kind of a long ramble about why why I don't you know really buy a lot of gear um, or any really, um, 
or do like plugin reviews or whatever. Um, I don't know if that's super interesting to or applicable to everybody that's listening, but I think, you know, or maybe it made you angry and you want to yell at me in the comments. Totally cool with that. Or maybe it made you think about something and you want to write that in the comments. Please, please do. I'd be happy to kind of talk more about this in the comments. So definitely let me know and see you next time. Oh, should we do an outro? Yeah. Alright, fuck it. <laughs>